Hello, I'm Tom Wright, speaking to you from my study in Oxford in England. It's very good to be with you, though I wish I could be there in person, but as we all know, there have been all sorts of restrictions, and at least we can do it this virtual way. I've been asked to talk about the biblical vision for justice. And I begin with the joy of things put right. When we say the word justice, what emotions come to mind? Many people today, if you ask them for a word association for justice, might think of the rather grim atmosphere of a law court or the dark satisfaction people get when a vicious criminal who's ruined people's lives is finally caught and punished. And today there are darker overtones when people use the word justice to signal revolution, provoking others to respond that that's just atheist Marxism totally opposed to the Christian message of spirituality and prayer and salvation itself. But the Bible knows nothing of that false either or. In the Bible, the word justice belongs closely with rescue or salvation, and so would call forth the emotion of joy. Think of the Psalms. Let the heavens be glad, says Psalm 98. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before Yahweh, for he is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. There are many Psalms that say the same thing. Think of Isaiah too, including that messianic passage in chapter 11. God equips the coming king with his own spirit of wisdom and understanding so that he will judge the poor with righteousness and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. That introduces the startling prophecy of a new creation which will abolish the traditional hostilities in the animal kingdom. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the kid, and so on. They will not hurt or destroy, declares Yahweh, because the earth will be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. A similar prophecy comes later in chapter 65, within the promise of new heavens and new earth. And again, there's a sense not just of astonishment, but of joy. It isn't hard to see why. Suppose you lived in a village in ancient Israel. Community life throws up many problems and disputes and apparent injustices. Rich and powerful people can easily exploit the poor, the widows and the orphans who have nobody to stand up for them. But once in a while, the judge comes round on his regular circuit, and the people who have been oppressed or robbed of their rights or their livelihood are longing for this moment. Things will be put right at last. The whole community will heave a sigh of relief. Justice means rescue. It means celebration. It means joy. This biblical vision emerges again in the majestic Psalm 72, which speaks lavishly about the coming king, who will rule over the whole wide world, not because he's a mighty warrior or the builder of great cities, but because he does justice for the poor and the widow and the oppressed. And the psalmist ends up praising God for the rule of this king. Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, he says. Blessed be his glorious name forever and ever. May his glory fill the whole earth. Amen. Amen. Now, these are just snapshots of the underlying biblical picture. They give us the clue not only to what people will think and feel when the Creator God finally does put things right, but also to the theological framework within which this makes sense. The God of the Bible doesn't act at a distance. He doesn't give instructions from a long way off while keeping his own hands clean. It seems that his reason for making this world in the first place was because he wanted and still wants and intends to make this world his own home. He wants to fill all creation with his glory, his love, his power, his justice. And this idea of God coming to dwell with people in this world is what you see in, for instance, the wilderness tabernacle in Exodus and Solomon's temple in 1 Kings or 2 Chronicles. And it's what we're promised at the end of Revelation. Look, says John, the dwelling of God is with humans. Many people in Western Christianity have totally ignored this theme because it's routinely been taught or just assumed that the point of biblical faith is finally to leave this world 
and go to dwell with God in his home somewhere else. But the Bible tells the story the other way round. It's about God coming to dwell with us. And that's why justice is such a priority. God wants to dwell with people. And since he is the creator, he has set things in motion so that things can be put right as far as possible in advance of his final coming when he will complete the job. And he will do this work of judgment and justice, not because he's a stern moralist eager to pounce on and punish anybody who steps out of line, but because he is the good and wise creator who longs to see his world reflecting and finally embodying his own glory. Psalm 72 has a particular emphasis we shouldn't ignore. In the Old Testament, the temple, and before that, the wilderness tabernacle, was designed as a small working model of the whole of creation. The first chapter of Genesis describes a world consisting of heaven and earth together, in other words, a temple. When Solomon built the Jerusalem temple, the glory of Yahweh came and filled it. And now, says the psalm, Psalm 72, the coming king will do justice, rescuing the poor and the widows and the orphans, so that God's glory may fill the whole earth. That is the larger promise to which the temple was pointing forward. Through the work of the coming king, God will put the whole world right. He will do what we might call restorative justice in order to come and make it his glorious home. The king builds the temple so that God's glory can dwell there amidst the people. The king does justice for the poor and oppressed so that God's glory can flood the whole world. No wonder the biblical promise of justice is also the assurance of joy. So to Jesus and the kingdom. As I hinted a moment ago, much Western Christianity has assumed that the biblical story is really all about humans leaving this world and going to live with God somewhere else. But that wasn't Jesus' message. All four Gospels insist that the justice dream, the joy dream of ancient Israel, was now being fulfilled, even though not in the way many had imagined. Mary's song, The Magnificat, is a fresh outpouring of that biblical celebration. So is Jesus' so-called Nazareth Manifesto in Luke 4. His early followers gradually realised that he was doing the new creation things the prophets had predicted, healing the blind and the deaf and the lame and so on, as in Isaiah. His parables spoke of God working deep-level justice, challenging the arrogant, the rich and the powerful, and planting new seeds of hope and forgiveness and restoration. Jesus spoke of God becoming king at last in order to explain what he himself was doing, partying with the down and outs, rescuing people from bondage, whether physical or mental or social or emotional. He went about, we might say, putting things right, the very heart of the biblical idea of justice. And John says that Jesus was thereby displaying his glory. Now, in the first century Jewish thought, time was divided into two, the present age and the age to come. And every week the Jews kept, as they still do, one special day, the Sabbath, as an advance sign of that coming time of justice and peace and joy. Jesus declared and went about demonstrating it that the time is fulfilled. In other words, that the coming age is already arriving. The implicit claim was that this was what it looked like when Israel's God came back in person to put everything right at last. And the heart of this claim was the almost equally strange idea that Jesus himself was the true king, the Messiah, the one spoken of in Isaiah 11, in Psalm 72, many other well-known prophecies. Granted, he wasn't setting himself up as the normal kind of king. He wasn't mustering an army to fight the pagans. On at least one occasion, his enthusiastic followers tried to push him in that direction, and he avoided it. But this wasn't because his kingdom vision was actually about people going to heaven instead. It was because his scripturally rooted vision of God's kingdom on earth as in heaven was about peace and justice, not vengeance and bloodshed. And in line with some of the strangest and darkest scriptural prophecies, his vision of God's coming kingdom of ultimate justice could only be attained by attacking injustice itself, 
at the root. To put the world right, Jesus had to take upon himself the full force of the world's injustice. And that, you see, is what the first readers would pick up from the stories of Jesus' crucifixion. We are so used to saying, truly, of course, that he died for our sins, that we sometimes ignore the massive, obvious surface meaning of the story, which is that the accusations levelled against Jesus, stirring up the people to revolt, forbidding him to give tribute to Caesar, pushing himself forward as a rival king of the Jews over against Herod or whatever, Everybody could see these were total misunderstandings, and his accusers must have known that too. But they were clearly jealous of his popularity, anxious for their own power. So the stories of Jesus' trials before Caiaphas the high priest and then before the Roman governor Pontius Pilate are stories about the justice bringer, the joy bringer, coming face to face with systems of injustice of untruth. Think of Pilate sneering at Jesus' claim to be telling the truth. <laughs> What's truth, says Pilate? Of the evil which corrupts and distorts and tortures and kills everything in its path. Jesus stood in that path. His crucifixion has many deep meanings which I have explored in other places. But we cannot ignore the plain meaning of the text that Jesus was taking upon himself the injustice of the world, and was dying under its weight. The way the stories are told indicates he was doing that in order to exhaust injustice at last. Faced with the horror of Calvary, it then looks as though the dream of Isaiah or the Psalms has been crushed forever. But Isaiah 53, one of the most famous prophecies, of the suffering servant had spoken precisely of that servant of the Lord whose life was taken away by oppression and injustice as he was wounded for our transgressions. And that is the story the Gospels tell. As Paul makes clear in Romans, after all, sin is simply one outflowing of the primary human diseases which are idolatry and, yes, injustice. Romans 1.18 how does this work? Well, when you worship anything other than the Creator God, you fail to reflect His image into the world, and instead you mess things up. In other words, injustice. Sin means missing the mark, the target of a genuine God-reflecting human life. But injustice is the larger reality. So any suggestion that because we are saved from sin, we don't need to bother about justice, is like saying that because I have cut my toenails, I don't need to worry if my whole foot has gangrene. So when we read the crucifixion this way, which is how the four Gospels tell it, the meaning of Jesus' resurrection stands out clearly. Jesus' resurrection has nothing to do with him leading us into a disembodied platonic heaven so that we can embrace an otherworldly life after death and forget about putting things right in this world. When we look at Easter from within the story Jesus himself was living and telling, we see first that by his death he has defeated the dark power of injustice. If he hadn't, the resurrection couldn't have happened. But second, that God's new world, as in Isaiah and the Psalms, has been launched. So how would this work? It didn't mean that Jesus would then set up a tribunal and dispense justice like an ordinary judge. His followers did ask in the first chapter of Acts whether this was the time that he would restore the kingdom to Israel, as though they were thinking that he might now displace Herod or the Romans or whatever. Jesus' reply to their question, like so much of his preaching, is a kind of yes but. Yes, if Jesus himself is now to be enthroned as Lord of the world, that's what the ascension is all about. He's the one who will put all things right, and therefore his followers are to go out into that world to be putting right people, to be his witnesses, his emissaries, to do as Jesus did, that is, to declare in action that he is Lord, that a new way of being human has been launched. But this wouldn't follow the normal worldly pathways of power, Go and read Mark 10, where Jesus makes exactly that point to James and John. And that's why the church then and more recently has so often been muddled and puzzled and has got it wrong. But the community of Jesus' followers, 
learning to worship Israel's God in and through Jesus himself and to invoke his spirit as the new energy they needed, well, the church was always designed as the small working model of God's new creation, of the world put right as the prophets and the Psalms had always imagined. So to the church in God's putting right plan. It's hard for us to speak wisely and biblically about the church. Many in our cultures have had bad experiences of church, whether through poor teaching or actual bad behaviour or just a sad dwindling and erosion of faith, hope and love. But it's also because for the last millennium, we have unthinkingly allowed the church to divide and subdivide over and over again, often down ethnic or socio-tribal lines. I grew up in a small town in the north of England, which had two Methodist churches within a few hundred yards of each other. One, I was told, was for the middle classes, while the other, apparently, was for the working classes. That now is laughable. It's astonishing. But that was kind of taken for granted. Heaven forbid that those two should come face to face on equal terms in worship. My grandfather was vicar of a small country church about 30 miles north of there, where the rich family in the big house in the village had their own private door into the church, leading straight into a high-backed family pew so that they could come and go without needing to see or be seen by, let alone greet, the rest of the village, many of whom would be their tenants or indeed their servants. And of course, for many generations, we've had black churches and white churches, but also Dutch churches and Portuguese churches, Japanese churches, Korean churches, and so on, despite the glorious vision in Revelation of a community of every tribe and people and language worshipping together. And that was always a vision in Revelation, not for some far-off distant future. That comes in Revelation 21, but I'm talking about Revelation 5 and 7 here. It was a vision precisely for the present age, inaugurated by Jesus, animated by his spirit. That is why Paul, at the climax of his greatest letter, speaks with urgent joy about different ethnic and language groups in the church in Rome getting together for worship. They had to learn how to set aside the differences that didn't make any ultimate difference. That's what Romans 14 is about. So that then, as he says in 15, verse 6, with one heart and voice, they would glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus the Messiah. He has in particular in mind Jews and Gentiles, but the point resonates as wide as the world. Now, you may be surprised that I speak of Romans 15 as the climax of the letter. One symptom of our Western problem is that many have been taught something called the Romans Road, which basically takes you as far as Romans 3 or 4, if you're lucky on to chapters 5 through 8, though it usually omits several key points even there. But Romans 4 itself, in one of the bits usually missed out, insists that God's promise to Abraham was that he would inherit the world. Not that he would go to heaven, but that the whole creation would become the province of his family, his heirs and successors. And then Romans 8 itself, again this is often omitted from those simple summaries, Romans 8 speaks of the whole creation being set free from its slavery to corruption and decay. Romans 9 to 11 then deals with the larger picture of God's plan for Israel and the world, picking up all sorts of strands from the first eight chapters. And then at last, Romans 12 to 16, reaching its climax in 15 verses 7 to 13, urges the church to become in its worshipping and witnessing life a small working model of that new creation. The ancient world had never seen anything like this, a community consisting of people of all sorts, their sole common factor being their faith in Jesus of Nazareth as the world's true Kyrios Lord, which was of course a Caesar title, and their belief that Israel's God, the Creator, had raised him from the dead. This explains the relationship of justification and justice. As long as we think of justification in terms of, I have said a prayer of faith, therefore I know I'm going to heaven, it makes little sense to link that to the need for justice in God's world right now. 
But Romans and the whole of the New Testament is not about going to heaven when we die. It is about God's kingdom coming on earth as in heaven. Jesus' followers, muddled and confused, though we often are, we share the vocation by the Spirit to be a living demonstration to the world of what that's supposed to mean. In other words, God has promised in Scripture and in Jesus to put the whole world right in the end. That's final judgment as in the Psalms. In the present time, he puts people right with himself, justification, so that they can be part of his putting right purposes for the world. Justice. If the justified don't have a vision of justice, they haven't understood what justification itself is all about. Let me just say that last bit again, because I think it's so important for this theme. God has promised to put the whole world to rights in the end, final judgment. In the present time, in advance of that, he puts men, women and children right with himself, justification by faith, so that they can be part of his putting right purposes for the world, so that we can be, as it were, a pilot project for a world set right. You see this particularly in the way Paul rounds off this final great paragraph in Romans 15, 7 to 13. He quotes four biblical passages, finishing with Isaiah 11, verse 10, where the root of Jesse rises to rule the nations, and in him the nations will hope. Paul is there completing the circle that he began in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 where he echoes Psalm 2 and 2 Samuel 7 with Jesus as the seed of David, marked out in power as God's son by his resurrection from the dead. The resurrection of the Messiah means a world put right. That's Isaiah's vision. As we saw, Isaiah 11 is that great passage about the wolf lying down with the lamb and so on, and the earth being full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. As so often when Paul quotes one verse, he's obviously got the whole context in mind. The point is clear. God will put the whole creation to rights. Those who are put right by the gospel are to come together in worship precisely across traditional lines of race and class and gender and anything else that might divide them as the sign to the surprised and su suspicious world that the creator God is on the move to put things right here and now in anticipation of what's still to come. Much of the New Testament is then a call to Jesus' followers to get this right. We find this call not least in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is not a rule book to be kept is all in order to earn our way to heaven, but it's the Jesus-shaped way of life on earth as in heaven for the new humanity. I've often said it before, people frequently assume that if God really wanted to put the world to rights, he would send in the tanks and blast out the opposition and clean up the mess. But hold on, we're talking about the God revealed in Jesus, not in Caesar or in Alexander the Great or somebody. When this God wants to put the world right, he doesn't send in the tanks. He sends in the meek and the poor and the humble and the people who are grieving over the world's sorrows. He sends in the peacemakers and the people who are, yes, hungry for justice. The Sermon on the Mount isn't offering a list of virtues you need to acquire in order to be on side with God. It is summoning Jesus' followers to become the people through whom God's putting right plan will come into effect already in the present world, in advance of the ultimate new age. Of course, this then includes holiness, prayer, trust, and so on. But when Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that we are to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness so that everything else will be added to us, this is focusing not so much on our own moral lives. That's taken for granted. That's part of the package, but it's not the main focus. It's focusing on the heaven and earth kingdom for which in this same sermon, Jesus in the Lord's Prayer taught us to pray. Now, of course, there are a thousand follow-on points for which we don't have time right now, and there is no shortage of resources to follow all this up. I've written various things and lots of other people have as well. But what I've done is to sketch very quickly the biblical picture of the creator God's plan to put the world right, 
which was decisively launched by Jesus and ever since Pentecost has been put into effect through the Spirit. The Church has often dragged its feet over this, sometimes gone in the entire wrong direction. Sometimes it's because, as we see sometimes in Acts, the Church hasn't quite grasped the whole message. Most of the letters in the New Testament are written because bits and pieces of the church here and there were getting it twisted and distorted and wrong. This is why we need ex expositors and theologians constantly to keep us on track. Sometimes it's because the message, though clear, clashes with vested interests, social or cultural or political. I fear that's part of the reason why many even today resist the plain teaching of Scripture and insist that the only thing we're supposed to be doing is to save souls for heaven rather than working for God's kingdom on earth as in heaven. But a moment's thought will tell you that's wrong. In the second and third centuries, when the Roman authorities were doing their best to stamp out this new movement, it was because the church was providing that small working model of a society running on totally different lines. That was why it got into trouble with the authorities. It was deeply subversive, suggestive of an entirely different way of life, to have a celebratory community with slaves and free together, with men and women together, Jews and Gentiles and everybody else together. And it was particularly subversive to the Roman Empire and its aspirations to see this small ramshackle group looking after the poor, providing health care and education where possible, standing up for the rights of the widows and the disadvantaged. The Roman world was run from the top for the top, and if anyone got in the way, they might well end up getting crucified. And that points us to the heart of it all, to one of the most extraordinary things about the early church. Crucifixion had long been a hated symbol of Roman injustice. Within a decade or two, it had become astonishingly a symbol of God's restorative loving justice, a sign of a God who is determined to put the world right and has come in Jesus to make that happen. This message took the world by storm with the news that the living God had taken the worst injustice the world could invent and having defeated it, had set in motion by his spirit, his long-awaited new creation, catching up individual men and women and children in that same sin-forgiving, life-giving, new creational good news movement. This biblical vision of justice is thus Trinitarian in shape, the Creator's plan implemented by the Son and the Spirit, eschatological in orientation, the ultimate future already inaugurated in the present, and spirit-led in its energizing source. Genuine spirituality and genuine justice go hand in hand. Jesus' followers, with the Bible at our elbow, are called to share in both together. Thank you very much.